this lecture, I would like to think about both the ontological dimensions of the mystery of the incarnation and philosophical implications of classical Christology. Can we speak truly of Christ, the person of the Son, as both true God and true man, if we are incapable of positive philosophical and natural discourse concerning both the divine nature and human nature? By human nature, I mean that essence in virtue of which we are each human and in virtue of which God who became human is one in nature with us. In what follows, I will present a brief account of the inward form of the classical use of the communication of idioms in Neo-Chalcedonian Christology. After this, I will argue that the assignments we make of nature terms to Christ in virtue of his divinity and humanity respectively though derived from reflection on divine revelation principally and associated with the central mystery of the faith, also require implicitly that we are naturally capable of thinking out philosophically what it means coherently to speak of the divine and human natures metaphysically. In addition, if we can conceive of a notion of human nature in Christ who is a divine person or hypostasis, we must also be able to think about personhood more generally in a way that is not merely reducible to the animality and temporal consciousness that characterizes us as human beings, but that is applicable by analogy to both human persons and divine persons. Were we unable to do this, we would in turn be unable to think about the hypostatic union and the core mystery of Christianity in a constructive fashion. Because we are able to think in this way, naturally there is a correspondent metaphysical apostolate of the Christian intellectual life to the broader philosophical culture and patrimony of the human race, even, and perhaps especially so, in our own religiously ambivalent or despondent epoch. So let me begin with the first part of the argument, Chalcedonian Christology and the ontology of the communication of idioms. Single subject Christology is derived from and enshrined in the basic givens of the New Testament as apostolic teaching, Christ is one person, subsisting in two natural modes of being. A case in point is to be found in Philippians 2, 6 through 11, where the preexistent Christ is affirmed as the Son, he who, though he was in the form of God, took the form of a servant, and as man became obedient unto death, even so as to be exalted in the resurrection. The mystery of descent of the pre-existent son into the human state and his subsequent human exaltation in resurrection in Paul's hymn culminates in the acknowledgement by the nations of the divine identity. He is given the name above every other name by those nations, Lord or Yahweh, who recognize in him the God of Israel denoted by the tetragrammaton of Exodus 3, 14, 15, through the medium of Isaiah 45 in its interpretation of that which Paul is purposefully alluding to in that passage. The fact that the passage claims that every knee will bend in adoration of Jesus suggests that the prophecies of Isaiah 45, 5 through 23 concerning an eventual universal recognition of Israel's God by all Gentile nations that is, com is now coming to pass in the recognition of Jesus of Nazareth as Lord, that is to say, as one who is both God and man, a man who was crucified and resurrected so as to reconcile the human race to the Father. Evidently, already in this primal confession of Christological faith, we perceive the nucleus of the classical use of the communication of idioms as expressive in turn of the ontology of what would eventually be confessed in a later dogmatic conceptual form 400 years later at the Council of Chalcedon. Christ is a singular subject of Paul of Pauline ascription to whom are attributed characteristics associated both with God, signified here by the form of God, the name of Yahweh, and his being a subject of worship. And ascribed to him are those characteristics of a human being, signified here by the suffering servant imagery associated in term with Christ's intentional obedience. He was obedient even unto death, death on the cross, therefore he has been highly exalted. His subjection to death implies the separation of body and soul, it could be argued, and his bodily resurrection and glorification are denoted, all of which pertain to him as man. 
There is, of course, a correspondence between this linguistic, linguistic pattern of ascription and the ontology it implies. Only if Christ is a single person who is both God and man can formulations such as this one make sense. The subject in question is pre-existent and divine since he exists in union with the Father prior to his historical experience of being human. But the subject in question is also the singular bearer of traits derived from each nature or form of being as Lord and man. It's significant to note that the authors of the Council of Chalcedon chose to denote the forms of Paul's Philippians 2, 6 through 11, which is alluded to very overtly at the center of the Council of Chalcedon, in ontological and semantic terms of nature or phusis, uh, terms having echoes in Hellenistic metaphysics. The proximate inspiration for the pronounced emergence of this pattern of interpretation was the famous uh, tome of Leo in his letter 28 to Flavian. It's not the exclusive origination, but it's an undisputed uh, influence. For in this text, Leo does two things theologically that are of capital importance for the subsequent history of Christology. First, Leo interprets the form of God and the form of the servant by making use of the Latin notion of natura, and in so doing, he also notes that the two natures are united but distinct and neither separated nor confused. Now, this language is clearly metaphysical in implication and would entail and would enter into the council's formulations themselves. It suggests that, th that God became human without ceasing to be God and without abolishing, altering, or any way doing violence to what it is to be human, essentially. In fact, it turns out, according to Leo, that God is the most human of us all. This idea suggests that there's not only no mutual inconcurrence or rivalry of divine and human natures in Christ, but in fact a kind of simultaneous plenitude of complementarity of imminence and transcendence simultaneously, as God is most imminently present in Jesus and is Jesus, or Jesus is God, and at the same time, there is the remarkable transcendence of God, of Christ's deity to his humanity that remains. The more God is present in our human nature, even by personal union with our nature, the more naturally human we are as well, as is perceptible in Christ. The perspective of Chalcedon was in turn self-consciously adopted and re-articulated by St. Thomas in the Summa Theologiae through the mediation and part of the influence of John Damascene, of whom he is a great student on this issue. Aquinas, following Damascene in his own way of interpreting him, effectively notes three rules that govern the right application of the communication of idioms, each of which has an ontological correspondent, or so I will affirm, with significance for our consideration of philosophical metaphysics. First, Aquinas notes that all attributes of the divine nature and of the human nature of Christ pertain to the single personal subject of the incarnate word. That is to say, whether we speak of the eternal generation of the Son or his human birth in time as man, we attribute such characteristics only to Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of the Father. He was born before all ages of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, and he was born in time of the Virgin Mary, son, uh, uh, sorry, of the Virgin Mary, and he is the son of Mary. He is the author of creation and the giver of eternal life, but he is also subject to human torture, suffering, and death. The only person is the person of the Son, and that same person is Jesus. Second, the attributes of the two natures are not rightly predicated of each other, at least on Aquinas' schematization, and thus should not, be and should not be confused with one another. They remain ontologically distinct and so always logically distinguishable. The divine nature of Christ is eternal, not temporal, immutable, not subject to alteration, impassable, not subject to suffering, all-knowing, not subject to nescience. The human nature of Christ begins to be always present in time and place, never omnipresent, finite, not infinite, temporal, not subject to conditions of eternal pre-existence. The human nature of Jesus then is not omnipresent or pre-existent or eternal, while the divine nature is not his, a historical process subject to development through time and subject to interactions with created realities that determine what God is essentially. Thus all nature terms, be they divine or human, can be, sorry, third, <clears throat> third, all nature terms, divine and hum, or human, 
can be employed grammatically as subject terms only and if they denote the personal subject considered under the aspect of a nature. What do I mean by that? Well, an example would be, we can say rightly, according to St. Thomas, God gestated in the womb of the virgin, or God was born in time, or God suffered personally on the cross, or God died 2,000 years ago on the cross, God died. These are all necessary statements and are orthodox because the term God is a nature term denoted of a specific person, the second person of the Son. This means it is not true to say the divine nature was born, suffered and died, or the Father or the Holy Spirit suffered and died, but only the Son who is God and man was born, suffered and died as a divine person who is truly human like us, and therefore God truly suffered, uh, was born, suffered and died. And likewise, we can say, pointing at Jesus, this man created this, the world, indicating Christ without implying that his human nature is the instrument of the creation. Or we may say, this man obeyed in order to save us all, without implying that his human obedience is constitutive of his eternal generation from the Father as the eternal Son. Now, the reason I'm going on about these very fundamental claims, which in themselves are actually quite elaborate and mysterious once you start to consider what they denote, is that they help us delineate the shape of a mystery in human language. They're not meant to render the mystery of the incarnation, life, suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ fully transparent to human reason, and even less are they supposed to create a magnificent geometry problem we can easily solve through the correct application of axioms. They also leave features of his existence um, uh, opaque or nebulous, but they don't merely do this, for they help rather to, to help us identify the inward territory or boundaries of the mystery of the faith and hopefully also to exclude potentially erroneous or counterfeit formulations that could mislead us. It seems to me in turn that one can identify three important ontological features that emerge from this inscape of mystery, rightly to be thought of as Christological truths, that in turn have implications for philosophical metaphysics without being reducible to the latter. And I'm not going to argue here that I'm not simply reducing a metaphysical conception of God's nature or human nature, but reducing the Christian mystery of the confession of the two natures to a merely philosophical metaphysics. I just want you to believe that I have ideas about why one mustn't do that. However, I do think there's a correspondence between the metaphysical or philosophical conception of nature and the theological investigation of the mystery of the nature of Christ as God and as man. The first ontological feature pertains, uh, feature of the mystery pertains to the person of the Son. He can begin to subsist as man by harmonization in the womb of Mary without true, ceasing to be truly God. Consequently, precisely as one who is God personally, he can also become subject to all that is human including birth, suffering, and death, which he truly experiences personally as the Son without ceasing to be unchangingly divine and one of the Holy Trinity. Now that is, of course, a magnificently complicated claim, but there are various sociological aspects to this mysterious truth. For example, God shows his divine solidarity with us by freely identifying with our finite human limitations and he can unite his ineffable, perfect divinity and saving power to us, even in the ontologically most compromised and worst circumstances of our human suffering. Everything we have as human, including our suffering, becomes his so that everything he has as God can become ours. Behind this sociological claim of the divine solidarity, we confront the mystery of God's gratuitous freedom to identify with us. It's grounded in his eternal identity, bliss, and perfect activity. The mystery from before the foundations of the world is personal, good, wise, and loving. Second, the two natures of Christ are not confused or mixed, but they also are not competitive rivals or mutually exclusive. Christ does not have to cease being God or freely practice canonic self-limitation in order to be human, nor does he need to take on a truncated or artificial human nature in order to be God. There are profound metaphysical implications to this claim. Christ is not a rival to his creation, sorry, God is not a rival to his creation 
seemingly because God is in no way exterior to his creation as creator, but is more intimate to created being than it is to itself, most in, or most interior to the effect of the creation, the esse commune of created being, without being merely identical with that creation as such. This means that God can uh, step out onto the stage of creation, as it were, and enter the drama of created history without either ceasing to be God or doing violence to human nature. For as we've noted, there was no one more human than Jesus, who is himself truly God. Furthermore, the human nature of Jesus can be subordinate to and, uh, and the instrument of the divine person, the humanity of the word, without in any way being diminished as human. On the contrary, the human nature of Jesus, his human actions of knowledge and love as man, become expressive of his personal identity as God, the Son, who manifests his eternal life and presence in and through his most human actions, words, gestures, teachings, affections, suffering, and miracles. It is the Son, God the Son, who shines radiantly forth in the most human life of Jesus as the child in the crib, as the crucified of Golgotha. Consequently, God expresses who God is, that is, his very deity, particularly in and through his human life and death, his human suffering and resurrection. And third, we can infer from the third of these rules of predication above an ontological mystery first identified by the Cappadocian Fathers. All works of the divine persons are works conducted through the medium of a nature. All works of a nature are works conducted by a personal subject. The one is a principle from which, which is the principle of hypostatic personhood, while the other is a principle through which, which is that of a nature. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit operate by virtue of, or in and through, the medium of their uh, incomprehensible shared divine life and nature as God, while the Son alone operates also by virtue of and in and through the medium of his human life among us as man. There are two significant features to this third idea. First, evidently from a Christian and therefore Trinitarian point of view, all things are ultimately personal in origin. The divine nature that has given rise to all things and that providently governs human history in view of salvation is a reality that is person, personal in nature. The universe exists from the communion of divine persons and in view of the communion of human persons, our ecclesial life of communion with God and other created persons, including the angels, as achieved by Christ. Second, in personal realities, all nature terms must be interpreted in a way that is in conformity with, but also not in opposition to, personal identity and vice versa. To have a personal identity is to live out your personal identity in a nature. To have a nature is to be thoroughly, naturally per personal. Negatively speaking, it's a great mistake then to oppose natural identity, for example, being human or being a biological animal with personal identity, as if one must either advocate for an ontology of persons or an ontology of physical natures or an, an ultimate transcendent metaphysics of naturalism that would be impersonalist or an ultimate um, metaphysics of personalism that would be anti-naturalist. One way to make this claim, this error, is to claim that a serious study of human nature must do away with personhood and personal dignity, which are now to be taken as mere folklore concepts from pre-modern religious cultures. The other, another way to do so is to claim that the acknowledgement of human personhood and of personal freedom requires that we delimit or deny the reality of nature as a normative concept for free human action or thought, as if freedom, and especially the pursuit of freedom in its pure instantiations, transcends physical nature or transcends nature as such, and as if the personal agent could or even must determine and mutate his nature in a plastic fashion <coughs> through history and culture in the service of personal freedom and the will to power. In reality, all personal acts of knowledge and love are also intrinsically natural acts. There's nothing more natural to a human being than to be intellectual and, and, and freely, deliberately loving. And they stem from these natural acts, natural principles of human knowledge and will. This is true in Christ's own human knowledge and freedom, which are reflective in turn of his uncreated divine life, his eternal natural wisdom and love as God. So now I turn to the second and slightly shorter part of the presentation, um, 
which is on the natural grounds of mystery, the Christological presupposition of a philosophical metaphysic. In the second part of this essay, I'd just like to argue the following thesis. In light of the ontology implied by the classical use of the communication of idioms, we can affirm that Chalcedonian Christology presupposes and inevitably makes use of various principles of classical metaphysics, in particular the notions of human nature and divine nature and of personhood are necessary for a coherent Christology. Why is this the case in what sense? I'm gonna focus specific more on human nature and personhood in this context. Clearly theological notions of nature and personhood are not merely reducible to or identical with our philosophical conceptions that may be achieved by the use of unaided natural reason without prior reference to divine revelation or even after reference to divine revelation but prescinding from its specific information. And I use information there not in the data sense but like the form of Christ making itself revealed to us, making itself manifest to us. What follows then is not the affirmation of a mere theological rationalism. Nevertheless, I take it that if the human being cannot think naturally about the existence of God and the nature of God as creator, however indirectly, apophatically, or analogically, then the very idea of the incarnation conceived in Chalcedonian terms begins to become literally unthinkable. The argument stated succinctly runs thus, every human being is naturally intellectually active by means of conceptual reflection and can only consider various realities as objects of knowledge in an active way if he or she has some conceptual purchase on the reality in question. The objective conceptual knowledge in question is derived from reflection on the realities that human beings experience and not from infused a priori concepts. This natural process being alluded to is not destroyed by divine revelation or the operative activity of grace in the human person. Consequently, if a person is to turn to God intellectually and freely under the prior instigation of grace, and you might say in its domain, and in relation to specifically revealed objects of faith, then the person must do this also actively by natural means of reflection subject to and subordinate to the truths of revelation and the movements of grace. If there, are, if there is no manner in which human beings can naturally actualize their capacity to know objects of revelation in any respect as objects of natural knowledge, such that there's no natural point of contact in which grace and revelation may address human beings, then either the divine revelation is so alien to human knowledge that human beings simply cannot actively consider it and grace is in fact somehow violent to human nature, or the knowledge communicated by grace provides in effect not only the supernatural object and inclination of faith, but also the full natural capacities, objects, and inclinations of knowledge, and in this case, the real distinction of nature and grace is collapsed. Divine revelation is no longer really a grace, but a form of infused knowledge innate to the human person. This argument applies more generally to the human being's capacity to arrive by its active power at a natural notion of God, but it applies in a specific way to the case of our consideration of Jesus Christ as a personal subject possessing divine nature and having its attributes predicated of him if that is to be thoroughly intelligible. Even if the divine nature of the Son is a mystery we understand in virtue of the grace of faith as one possessed in common with the Father and the Spirit and made known to us, by way of divine revelation. Its reception in human thought requires an analog concept drawn from philosophical understanding that allows the human nature to orient itself towards God. Were this not the case, the judgment of faith that Christ, who is truly God, possesses in his fullness the divine nature, or Christ is God, would stand completely outside the ambit of the natural capacities and range of human knowing. In this case, the gift of faith would be so extrinsic to the human intellect as to remain inassimilable. Positive knowledge of the divine nature is a natural requirement if the human person is to be in what I will call obediential potency to the gift of grace that permits him to know and affirm that Christ is God. And employing the notion of obediential potency, I'm suggesting that we have no natural intellectual inclination to know of the Trinity as such in supernatural form or essence, but that we do have a natural inclination to think about God analogically and about the divine nature and that this inclination can be so elevated by grace as to be placed in the service of reflection on the mystery of the Trinity 
the Trinitarian unity as such. I do think there's a natural desire to want to see the essence of God in Aquinas, but that's another matter. This means that only if there's a metaphysical range of knowledge that can affirm the existence of God coherently and demonstrably as a truth of reason, is it possible to develop a reasoned account of the intellectual possibility of faith and in turn also an intellectually self-conscious dogmatic theology. Dogmatic reflection on Christ without metaphysics would be in this respect an insincere act of the mind by which the activity of faith would orient the mind towards an end purely extrinsic to any conditions of human thought, leaving the latter, for human reason, imminent to itself without intrinsic reference to divine truth and life, despite the presence of the grace of faith. Likewise, the basic theological commitment to Chalcedonian Christology requires a metaphysics of human nature that permits us to identify a structure of human nature attributed univocally to all human beings. That's to say, there is an essence of human nature, one adopted by God in the incarnation, that is present universally by way of identity of kind in all human beings. We all share a common nature, and Christ shares this nature with us as well. It's rather important that it be ascribed univocally because there aren't some people who are not human. Note at, for at least two reasons this must be the case for theological motives. Firstly, if we cannot in any way identify the essential nature of man in its universal specification by making use of the instruments of natural reason, then we also cannot in any way understand what it means to say that God became a human being, having a human nature in solidarity and plenary identification with us. In this case, the universal soteriological significance of the incarnation is somehow eclipsed. What does it even mean to say that God became truly human and that this has a universal meaning for the whole human race, a group of entities that share a common nature and destiny? A merely extrinsic Christological designation of human nature in which we would, for, you know, Christological, it would be a unique, Christ, uniquely Christological grounds for affir affirming a common nature in us. Um, would I think not do because we would not be able naturally to identify what a human being is as distinct from something having the mere accord of phenomenological appearances. Christ's divine attempt to draw the so-called human race into unity would be ineffective necessarily if we cannot ourselves even recognize, even potentially under grace, what human nature is, so that which is subject as that which is subject to redemption in each of us. Grace can heal or sharpen the capacities of natural intellect to identify the essence of man, and the church's philosophical and natural law, culture, and traditions serve to do this in a myriad of ways. But they can only do so because there already exists in each human being a predisposition or natural capacity to think realistically about human identity and its essential components. Finally, we need a concept of personhood, that is, analogical and flexibly applicable to human subjects, angelic created immaterial realities, and to the divine persons, if we wish truly to take seriously the mystery of the incarnation. The core message of Christianity is concerned with the uncreated hypostatic communion of persons, the Trinity, that is manifest to human persons so that they may embark teleologically so as to become fully alive persons, that is to say, beings of vision and communion, made in the image of God, who grow in spiritual likeness to the word and to the spirit of the Father by their participation in the uncreated life of God. The Christian notion of personhood then is more theocentric and you might even say cosmic, transcendent in orientation than it is anthropocentric or historico-temporal in scope. It allows one to see that personal reality is the cause of non-personal reality, but also that for this very reason, the society of persons we inhabit and constitute as rational animals is a society made for collective ecclesial communion with God by grace. The ancient Christian categories of hypostasis and persona which convey this sense are properly mysterious, not readily dominated by the gaze of the naive rationalism. This Christian concept of personal identity invites us to make pilgrimage through history unto the uncreated ground of communion and into our vocation to become persons progressively in the light of Christ. As concepts, they are less psychological and material than mon modern continental philosophical notions of the human agent tend to be, and because they are more profound and more radiant, 
they have more metaphysical content. They are applicable thus by analogy to those having intellectual nature who are above our natural state. Persons are those open to the knowledge of being. Persons are those open to the knowledge of being in its mysterious fullness, truthfulness, goodness, beauty. Natures are that intellectual and loving voluntary kind of being that are personal. Our natures are that kind of intellectual and voluntary loving being that is personal. Human persons are thus divine, defined by reference to human nature in an embodied rational mode of knowledge and love, angelic persons to angelic nature and its finite and immaterial created modes of knowledge and love, and divine persons to divine nature in its incomprehensible, uncreated, and simple singular mode of knowledge and love, which also implies eternal communicability by relations of origin of begotten logos and spirated love who are one in being with the Father. On this view, individual personhood of the singular subject is a distinctive mode of expression of a common intellectual nature, individual personhood of a singular subject in a distinctive mode, the, the Petrine, Pauline, or Joanine way of being a human being, uh, is a distinctive manifestation of what it is to be human. Applied analogically in the distinct cases, you can do this to the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit as modes of being God. It helps one understand the irrepeatability and uniqueness of the person in God and in the human subject, since each human person is distinct and the Divine Father is not the Son or the Spirit. But it also helps us understand the shared nature of man and of God, which is the principle of communion with another person in the same nature, as well, of communion, as, well as the principle of communion between incomprehensible, uncreated hypostases and originate and dependent created natural persons because our intellectual nature is a nature capable of communion not only with those of the like kind, but those above our state, but those above our state are also capable by their intellectual nature of communion with us. This rich concept of the Christian tradition thus cannot be readily reduced to a modern philosophical notion of the historical human subject, for example, through the medium of the Cartesian cogito, the Lockean consciousness, the Kantian transcendental subject in its dazzling, fascinating capacity to draw all people to itself, or even, and here it is, I guess, the Heideggerian Dasein. These are pale and wan substitutes that will not nourish the mind of modern people sufficiently if they are vexed by the question of a truly thorough consideration of the sense of the human condition and the range of human possibilities. So I'm moving to conclude. Reflection on Christology and philosophical reflection on metaphysics both take place, both take place together within a shared singular history in which they are integrated into a singular multivalent cultural Christian culture of faith and reason. This life of reflection on Christological ontology occurs for the church first and foremost to clarify her confession of faith and in order to communicate it evangelically. That confession of faith is Christological but by the ver that very measure, it also takes place for the world at large, since it seeks to explain reality philosophically in light of Christ and in relation to God's existence among us as a human being. If the incarnation has a universal horizon of meaning and intelligibility so that all things are explained in the light of Christ, then there must also be a way in the church and in culture at large to think about all that is philosophically in light of God and to think about the place of human nature within the larger framework of the existence of the world that God has made. Where this is impossible on the natural level, we would be incapable of making every thought subject to Christ, as St. Paul enjoins us to do in 2 Corinthians 10, in subordination to the supernatural life of grace, or in plenary integration. For these same reasons, the universal proclamation of the mystery of Christ requires not only a theoretical Christology, but also a metaphysical apostolate as a dimension of Christology. In concrete history, the church confesses Christ as both true God and true man in every generation. In doing so, she also has learned through the ages to speak of God and man naturally, that's to say philosophically, in every generation, in the service of the gospel and as a dimension of her own evangelical mandate. She must do so so as to articulate the mystery of one person in two natures Jesus Christ, true God and true man, for this is the only Orthodox Christology that there is. 
I'd like to just finish by making a comment on the aspiration of the conference, um, which I, I love what David said. I took the aspiration of the conference slightly in a different direction that's not incompatible, which was is, is, has to do with the communication of the Christian intellectual patrimony in our world today. And obviously what I'm indica indicating in this essay is that there are certain grounding concepts that are extremely rich from the ancient and medieval Christian past that can be re-articulated, rediscovered, retrieved, and, uh, and communicated, or maybe even wondered at anew. And I think that we have a, like a, a kind of basically a fundamental uh, need to do so if we're to make m sense of the mystery of Christ in our midst uh, and make it communicable. But to extend this to a more general uh, reflection on the aspiration of the communication of the Christian faith in a secular epoch, I would say that um, I think Christian thinkers need to reflect in public on the intelligibility of the claims of the creed. They need to reflect on the truth of the creed and all the logically incumbent aspects, or to take a, a kind of other term than David used, but very much in league with what he was saying uh, about form, the anal analogia fide, the, in the 19th century Catholic sense, the, 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 the tissue of the mysteries of the faith as they relate to each other intelligibly and illuminate human existence. Uh, and I think to do that, we also need to make metaphysical and philosophical claims uh, about the world and articulate those in dialogue with our contemporaries in, in, so as to make those philosophical stepping stones available to people as they also try to make their way toward the recognition of the truth of the faith proclaimed in the creed. Thank you very much.